I'm delighted that the German government now agrees with my view, first expressed on February the 28th of this year on my website that the fuss over the coronavirus was an exaggeration. They have not, however, gone far enough to agree with my view expressed on the same date that there were a number of hidden agendas. I still stand by everything I said on the 28th of February 2020 and in my first video recorded in mid-March and entitled Coronavirus Scare the Hoax of the Century. I wonder how many government ministers and advisers can still stand by everything they've said. It's time, I think, to take a brief look at where we are. Today in Britain we live in a country split in two. Half believe that some dirty hidden agenda is behind what's happening and that the lockdown and social distancing are a nonsense. The other half, now woefully obedient and impoverished in spirit, are just waiting for the promised vaccine. When it arrives they'll be begging to be first in the queue, whatever the risks might be. I don't mean to be rude, but I sometimes feel that a good many have been so terrorised, so overwhelmed with the government's barrage of fake news that they've turned into zombies. If St Vitus turned up, they would dance behind him to the ends of the earth. They'd follow the Pied Piper of Hamelin anywhere if he promised them safety from the virus. So it is, I think, time to take a cold, hard look at where we are now and what's happened since the end of February, during which time everything has changed. And those of us who are creatures of habit are still desperately searching for new habits to which we can cling. GPs all around Britain shut their surgeries back in March and many have been offering only telephone and video consultations. No one's yet managed to explain to me how it's possible to listen to a chest, look in a sore ear, palpate an abdomen or check a breast lump from the other end of a telephone. Maybe medical techniques have advanced a good deal since I was a GP or maybe a good many diagnoses will be missed and a good many GPs will be spending the next few years fighting in the courts to defend themselves against malpractice suits. Trying to diagnose patients through a video link isn't much better than using the telephone. GPs need to see their patients face to face. Looks, instinct, rapport and even smell are all important when understanding patients and making diagnoses. Opticians and dentists are effectively closed, though dentists will be opening soon, to try to deal with the huge backlog of patients needing emergency treatment. I wonder how many million teeth will be lost unnecessarily. I wonder how many people will lose their sight because of the lockdown. I doubt if we will ever know. In the UK, hospitals are nearly shut and nearly empty. UK figures show that 2.4 million cancer patients are now waiting for surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, screening checks and mammograms. Patients who attend any medical facility or ring 999 or 111 will be labelled according to whether or not they have respiratory signs or symptoms. Those who do have respiratory symptoms will be assumed to have COVID-19 since it's the default diagnosis. They'll be put into whatever hospitals and the government think of as isolation and other possible diagnoses will almost certainly be ignored. There's no scrutiny or oversight of treatment programmes. Hairdressers will open soon, but the local hospital has announced that it's no idea when the physiotherapy department will open. And churches are still closed for the, for the foreseeable future, which, given the fact that few have a congregation that would threaten social distancing, is downright cowardly and utterly shameful. Anyone seeking spiritual comfort or solace will have to manage without. The rules about social distancing and the lockdown are so absurdly complicated that hardly anyone understands them. One of the government's advisers said that if we all kept three feet apart we'd be fine. Actually he said a metre but I haven't gone metric and I don't intend to do so. But another two said that we had to stay six foot six inches apart. The World Health Organisation, which is supposed to know about these things, said three feet would do nicely. And so did the European Centre for D Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping six feet and a bit apart will destroy cafes, pubs and restaurants, cinemas, theatres and most of everything else. There doesn't seem to be any science at all showing how far we should be advised to keep apart. The only real science is that which shows that coughs and sneezes can travel 24 feet. 
but no one has suggested that we all stay 24 feet apart. There's some evidence that the military like to keep people six feet apart because it makes identification easier. The government has said that up to six friends or neighbours may come into your garden, possibly uh, unless they're over 70 years of age. If you're in Scotland, then you can have eight friends or neighbours to visit. In Wales, you may invite people from two households, so two big families could produce a gathering of two dozen or more. But all this jolliness must take place out of doors. The visitors can only go through your house in order to get to your garden or in extremis to visit the loo. Visitors are warned officially that they should go to their own loo before visiting so as to reduce the likelihood of this being necessary. And what if it rains? Well, the rule seems to be that you have to stay out of doors and so everyone will just have to get drenched and hope they don't develop pneumonia. Oddly, as far as I know, there have been no official rulings specifically banning guests from sheltering in a greenhouse, garden shed, log shed or coal bunker. People coming into the country have to go into a quarantine for a fortnight, so that's the end of airlines, tourism and heaven knows what else. The confusion appears to be global. In one part of the United States it is illegal to sit on the beach but legal to swim in the sea, but in another part it's legal to sit on the beach but illegal to swim in the sea. If anyone in any government understands the rules they'd doubtless produce an app to help punters and the government advisers to find out what is and isn't allowed. In Germany, police arrested a man for not wearing a mask, but the police who did the arresting weren't wearing masks. It's been revealed that the mass media were bought with government advertising, and governments are now officially the main source of fake news. The wise will never again buy a newspaper or read one online. We expect the BBC to betray us, but not the tabloids. I say this with great sadness, for during, for during two decades, I wrote columns for four national newspapers in the UK and around 5,000 articles for magazines and newspapers. Juries have been abandoned and criminals are now judged by establishment plants sitting alone. The government is bringing in a law to make it illegal to reveal information about what's going on in Britain or to criticise anything that's happening. The punishments will be draconian. School teachers are exhibiting remarkable ignorance in that the danger to them is not from children, but, if at all, from other teachers. They've been seen dressed in the sort of protective gear you might choose if you were planning to remove six tons of asbestos from an old church. If they don't want to catch the new flu, they should just avoid other members of staff. Children, terrified and scarred for life, will never recover from this unnecessary trauma. Shoppers have to wait outside, rain or sunshine, until someone leaves, since most stores only accept a very limited number of customers. In some parts of the world, shoppers have to go through a special shower cubicle where they'll be sprayed with a light mist of a saline solution. Spraying water in a mist is, of course, the way in which Legionnaire's disease usually spreads. Once in a shop, potential customers aren't allowed to browse or try on items if it's a clothes shop. There'll be no cafes and no loos in those shops. On the internet, the 77th Brigade of the British Army, which exists to fight information warfare, seems to have turned its attention inwards onto British taxpayers. There's now a special force of three to 4,000 British soldiers engaged full-time in removing material from social media. There are said to be 20,000 more keyboard warriors in reserve. The army is working with the Cabinet Office Rapid Response Unit to squash dissent. Goebbels and his chums were good at that sort of thing. I wonder whether we can thank the army for the distractions which have effectively changed the news agenda recently. Whether the army is deciding what to remove from the internet or obeying orders from somewhere else, this doesn't seem an entirely democratic action. But then we aren't living in a democracy anymore. We're paying soldiers to take down the truth so that the government's lies will prevail. This, we're being constantly told, is the new normal. What a hideous phrase. Is this how life is going to be? It certainly isn't a normal I'm prepared to accept. Normal is a world, is a world where honest, law-abiding folk can speak their mind and say what they think without fear of being banned, demonised or imprisoned. What's normal about a world in which anyone who questions the government is labelled a dissident, a subversive 
or a conspiracy theorist. What's normal about a world where thousands of soldiers paid by us to protect us spend their days censoring what we say and eradicating the truth so that the fake news spread by the government can prevail? Nearly half the people in the country are now being paid by the government one way or another and when the government stops handing out money many of them will be unemployed. Billionaires living in tax exile are being showered with taxpayers' money so that they don't have to spend their own money to keep their businesses alive. And that's all normal, is it? How bad has this infection really been? Well, most doctors with brains now agree with me that governments, particularly the government in the UK, have deliberately exaggerated the death total in order to justify their exaggerated response. Whatever the death total is alleged to be today, you can take a third out of the total to cover the elderly people who died needlessly and criminally in nursing homes and care homes. And half to two thirds of those left would have died anyway of an underlying disease. Of the remaining deaths, a goodly proportion were wrongly labelled since they died with the coronavirus rather than of it. And most of the rest were over 80 years old and very frail. And whatever you're left with, should be compared with the death rate from the ordinary influenza, which in a bad year in the UK can easily reach 50,000. The global deaths from flu can exceed 600,000. Everything I'm saying in here, in this video, is true. But how long will it stay online? As I've been saying nearly for nearly three months now, I feel safe in guaranteeing that the coronavirus total will be nowhere near as high as a bad flu total. So the only possible conclusion is that the coronavirus is no more dangerous than the ordinary flu and possibly not as dangerous as a bad flu. Even Ferguson, the serial dunce whose past record makes him the Eddie the eagle of mathematical modelling but without the sense of fun and patriotism and whose sums were the trigger for the lockdown now agrees that we would have been just as well off following the Swedish route and ignoring the notions of a major lockdown. I have to confess, by the way, that I can't believe anyone who is looking for someone to give advice about a deal, how to deal with an epidemic and who looked at Ferguson's past record would put him in a short list of 60 million out of a population of 60 million. Is Ferguson the most incompetent scientist on the planet? I don't know, but I'd vote for him. I've discussed his track record before. It is, I think, sufficient to say that I would find it embarrassing if it were mine. Presumably, Comrade Boris knew of all this when he hired him. If there were prizes for cocking things up, then Comrade Boris would get the gold cup. Unless, of course, he was acting under orders. I don't wish to be rude, I really don't, but you'd have to be a moron to believe that the lockdowns, the social distancing, and the fact that we're living in a police state have anything to do with a bug that would have a hard job to give a flu bug a run for its money. Only MPs, the BBC, assorted hack journalists and a bunch of assorted celebrities and around 20 million assorted gullibles still believe that we're being threatened by the 21st century of the plague. The questions queue up to be answered. Why are we still destroying the world when Dr Gupta, an epidemiology professor at Oxford University, reported that the death rate from the coronavirus is between 0.01% and 0.1%, making it no more of a threat than the flu? Who is going to pay for the fact that the UK will have one of the highest death rates in the world and one of the worst social and economic results? Why do the experts seem unable to differentiate between assessing the number of people who will catch the disease and the number who will die if they do catch it. Did Boris Johnson really have the coronavirus? It was a most convenient disease. Well, it, was he really as ill as we were told? Is it true that everything's being done in order to sell a vaccine which will be compulsory and made gazilli make gazillions for people? Is the sound we all hear at 8pm on Thursdays now the sound of lawyers rubbing their hands with glee? If the lawsuits start coming then Ferguson and Imperial College may well need even more money than Bill Gates has got in order to pay for this monumental series of disasters. Just think of all those thousands of people dying in care homes. Are we going to see the biggest murder trial in history? 
So is the government comprised entirely of morons? I wouldn't say it was impossible. I certainly wouldn't want anyone in the government or any of the advisers taking an IQ test for me. Cummings is said to be the brains behind the government and that says, says enough. The result is that the UK is now the most buggered country on the planet. As we search for explanations, the questions just keep on coming. Who bought the government? What's going to happen next? It isn't about science and it isn't simple politics. So it must be about money and control. Is the plan to force a civil war between those who are desperate for the lockdown to continue and those who are equally determined that it should end now? I have no idea. No one would believe what's happened if it were written as a science fiction novel. There's nothing they won't stoop to, and nothing I consider impossible. We must now assume the worst of our government at all times. The only real certainty is that living through this is worse than living through a war. We aren't likely to be bombed, it's true, but in a war you do at least know who the enemy is, what's going on, and what the end game is likely to be. Today, those of us who can see the truth look around and are bewildered by the lunacy of the grovelling masses, terrorised into obedience. I no longer believe anything I'm told by the governments or the, or the media. Remember my three-phrase mantra, distrust the government, avoid mass media, fight the lies. Paranoia is now the only sensible, healthy, sane condition. Those who protest now regard themselves as being members of a resistance movement, trying to rescue the last vestiges of freedom and democracy. Britain used to be a wonderful place to live. No more, we're now weaker than any other nation. No one will want to come here, and everyone who lives here will want to leave. Someone is going to have to pay for all this. We can and will win this war, and we have to think of it as a war the most crucial in our lifetimes. What can you do? Ask everyone you know to watch this video. When the British Army can't take down the truth as fast as we put it up, then we'll win. What have we come to? If enough people care, we can win this war. Thank you for watching an old man in a chair again. Sorry if I got a bit angry. I'm there are plenty more videos on this channel. If you want to watch more of them, please subscribe to the channel because the videos have a tendency to disappear or be lost in the ether and the video transcripts appear on my website www.vernoncolman.com which like the video channel has no advertising and no sponsorship. The video channel is I'm delighted to say open 24 hours a day. Thank you for all your support and encouragement and thank you for watching.